The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the ninth chapter of Luke's Gospel. And as you're turning there, I want to say again, thanks to Sean for filling in for us this morning. Thanks, man. Luke chapter 9, we'll be reading verses 28 uh, through the first part of verse 43. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke chapter 9, uh, beginning with verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, so that we may do what you would have us to do, so that we may be the people you are calling us to be. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, a few summers ago, some of you recall, about 17 of us boarded a plane bound for the city of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I still remember what it was like when we got off of that plane. The musty airport that smelled like an old Greyhound station. I think there were even some chickens in a cage somewhere. The people rushing past us. The men in gray suits and red hats all helping to help us so that they could ask us for money. The sudden realization that we're not in Kansas anymore. Or maybe more to the point we're not in Williams anymore that we were in another country, that we were now the foreigners. I still see in my mind that ocean of people when the doors to the airport opened, a seemingly endless, all the way it felt to the horizon, just people everywhere, crowded together, hoping to beg for a few dollars from those making their way out from the airport. And then there was the ride to the school, where we were staying in the back of a blue truck, and, and she's not here, but I remember Amy holding back everybody's bags. And I remember thinking, man, I ain't messing with Amy. <laughs> it felt more like a cage, really, than a cabin in the back of that truck. We drove over the rough roads of that broken country, passing people, burning palm trees to make charcoal, women carrying naked babies and pieces of fruit in their arms, men sitting with their legs crossed on the sidewalk, trying to sell what most of us would consider garbage. And then there was that smell. 
I won't tell you who said it, but somebody said it smelled like Zatarans and sewage mixed together. We stayed in a school building made out of concrete right in the center of the city, surrounded by, a, uh, I don't know, half a dozen other crumbling buildings, tents and lean-tos that were thrown together with sticks and tin. And in the week that we were there, we witnessed some pretty heartbreaking things. Malnourished babies, sick parents, discouraged families living in groups in abandoned buildings. But we also witnessed some pretty wonderful things. We stayed at a school where children were learning. That was the first time I think I'd ever heard that song from Frozen, Let It Go. Now, some of you are thinking, I just got that out of my head. <laughs> but the kids were there. They were learning. They were being fed. They had a safe place to sleep. We worshipped one Sunday with brothers and sisters, and I'll never forget the pastor's son who was strutting, carrying the flowers into the sanctuary, just so happy to be there. We experienced miracles, and I won't use that word lightly, as we fed hundreds of children when it seemed like we didn't have enough to feed them all. And we glimpsed heaven as we sat around in tables in crowded rooms, eating conch curry and drinking Coke and fruit champagne, which my sister-in-law still brings back for me every once in a while from Haiti. We were eating the best mangoes, and I think really the best fried chicken I ever had was our last day in Haiti. It wasn't all overwhelming. It wasn't all third world discouragement. Most of it was downright, well, heavenly, pretty good. And I can remember one night sitting on the roof of the building. It was three stories, and you could sit up on the roof. The breeze was cool. Everyone else was downstairs winding down for the night, and the power was out. They would shut the power out in Port-au-Prince in sort of circular blocks, except for when the World Cup was on, we were told. And the air that night was filled with the sound of dogs barking, roosters who had missed the sun or had their clock set wrong. And then there was what we assumed was an all-night church service that somebody told us might have been an all-night voodoo service. Who knows? There was an occasional motorcycle or car that would go by. The moon was bright. I remember it was directly overhead. And it looked like the sky had circles around the moon. The sun was the same way during the day. I'm sure there's a word for that, but I can't remember what it was. But as I sat there that night, I had this enormous sense of peace. As if all was right with the world, as if things were as they should be. Here we were doing what God had called us to do in the right place for the right people. This is how it was supposed to be. And I closed my eyes and I wrote later in my journal, I wish I could feel this way all the time, that I could just stay right here in this moment at peace. And then there was a loud bang. Maybe a car backfired. Maybe someone slammed a metal gate closed. Maybe it was a gunshot. I don't know. I came back to my senses, went back down, went to bed, and started the next day. Right now, there's still children living in that school who need food and an education, especially right now as the country of Haiti is tearing itself apart with uncertainty and political unrest. There's still families who are living in raw sewage. There's still those who are cast out and marginalized who need to be told they're loved. All is not peaceful. All is not right with the world. And things are not as they should be, whether it's there or right here. We've got to come out. I've got to come out of my comfort coma every once in a while, snap out of my sense of serenity, and come down off the mountain every once in a while so that we can do what we're called to do. Because I'm convinced that this life to which Christ calls us is a life that's lived down off the mountain. You see, when Jesus took James, John, and Peter up the mountain with him, he took them up there to pray. And we know, because we know the rest of the story, that Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. We'll begin heading towards Jerusalem next week with the first Sunday of Lent. And that way to Jerusalem ultimately leads to Calvary, to the cruelest of deaths upon a cross. And on the way, Jesus and his disciples will encounter adversities, challenges, overwhelming and heartbreaking situations. So, of course, Jesus, before he sets out, says, we got to go pray. They need this respite of prayer. They need these times when they can come together to listen to the heart of God and ask for courage, for wisdom and peace patience. But Luke tells us while they are praying, Jesus is changed. Jesus is transfigured before them. That the appearance of his face changed. 
And his face, his clothes became dazzling white. And not only is Jesus' divine nature revealed in this transfiguration, but he's joined by the spokespersons of the law and the prophets. Luke says, suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah. How they knew it was Moses and Elijah, I don't know. Maybe it's just intuition, but there they were, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departures, the way the NRSV translates it, but the Greek word is actually of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah are speaking with Jesus about his work, his exodus, his work in Jerusalem, his crucifixion, his death burial, and subsequent resurrection. Now we're told that Peter, James, and John were were weighed down with sleep, that they were tired, but they were fully awake when they saw this transfiguring, this appearing going on. And so in verse 33, Luke says that just as Moses and Elijah were leaving Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwelling places, three tabernacles, three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Luke says he doesn't know what he's saying. Peter and presumably James and John are caught up in the glory and the awe of what they just witnessed. They want to stay up on the mountain. The the, the tenses of the verbs there are indefinite. They want to build these tabernacles and just stay. They want to stay up on the mountain, set up these tents for Jesus, for Moses and Elijah, have an extended prayer meeting, just the six of them. Have a little revival, maybe a private spiritual retreat that just goes on forever and ever and ever. Or they can study the scriptures and pray together. After all, how could it get any better, right? How could it get any better than this? Jesus and Moses and Elijah together in one place. You couldn't sell enough tickets to fill that room. And I imagine in that moment, in that place for them, it seemed as if all was right with the world as if they were in the best place they could ever hope to be, as if it couldn't possibly get any better than it was right then, right there on top of the mountain. They were caught up in this glorious moment of divine revelation. And then, well, it wasn't a bang. It wasn't a car backfiring. It was a voice. A voice that says to them, This is my son, my chosen Listen to him. I think it's worth noting that in this moment of devotional desire, this wish for worship, that the voice of God declares to Christ's followers that Jesus' identity, yes, is God's Son. And what does he say? Does he command them to, well, just stay here and worship him? No. Adore him? No. Quote him? No. Paint his picture and hang it over your fireplace at home? No. The voice of God commands the followers of Jesus to listen to him. And that's more than just hearing the sound of his voice or reading his words and saying, that seems like a pretty good idea. It's about listening to the words of Jesus until they become part of who you are, until you put them into action. It's a wake-up call to the three disciples on the mountain with Jesus especially in light of what takes place when they come down off the mountain. Luke says on the next day when they come down from the mountain, there was a great crowd there. And then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you, I have a son. A spirit seizes him. All at once he shrieks, it convulses him. He foams at the mouth. It mauls him. It scarcely leaves him alone. And I begged your disciples to cast it out. But they couldn't do it. You know, I wonder who pointed the first finger. Here are James, John, and Peter coming down from the mountain, probably looking around going, I wonder who it was, or which one of you did they come to? Can't you just imagine it? I begged your disciples to do it, but they couldn't. Oh, he didn't ask me, Jesus. I could have done it. I'm, I'm sure I'd have done it. I'm not sure who he asked, but it wasn't me. Well, we figured, you know, he was coming, and, and there are bigger fish to fry. I mean, we, y'all were up on the mountain. We didn't know Jesus. We figured he might have been trying to take advantage of us. Figured his son may have been just putting on, or, or maybe, maybe, you know, Jesus, these young people, maybe he was strung out on something. I don't know. I can hear them denying the man's claim, questioning it, maybe, saying that, oh, well, we were never asked. They were just being cautious. 
not wanting to take advantage, be taken advantage of by folks who, who knew them to be Jesus followers. I can hear them because I've said those things myself. Well, you can never be too careful. You know, you help some folks, and if you help them once, they'll be back again. If you help them once, they'll just keep coming right on, always with another sob story. You just got to be careful. You know, I don't really even think they're that bad off. You know, really, I mean, there's a medication for that. Uh, uh, did you see the expensive phone she had in her purse? Why, when he drove up here, did you see the wheels on that car? Oh, I've said those things. Sometimes it's hard to come down off the mountain because we're afraid we can't trust anyone down off the mountain. Because sometimes it's hard to come down off the mountain because we're afraid we can't trust anyone to be honest with us. But Jesus said one time somewhere else, Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes your goods, do not ask for them again. And then the voice from the cloud says, This is my son. Listen to him. Of course, the man who they meet at the bottom of the mountain, his story is a heartbreaking one. His only son is possessed by a demon. And we can kind of pick that all we want, but in Luke's story, he's possessed by a demon. Causes him to shriek, to convulse, to foam at the mouth, to injure himself, to have violent seizures, spells of self-mutilation. And it's an overwhelming thing to be sure. And so when he says, I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't, who can blame them? Perhaps they wept with him. Maybe they prayed with him and said, I'm sorry, but there's nothing else we can do. Maybe they tried to cast out the demon, tried to heal the boy, but the situation was so dire, so pitiful, that their emotions got the best of them. And they came to the realization that the only hope was a miracle. And that they themselves weren't the sources of miracles. I remember a story Fred Craddock used to tell. About one time a woman came to his office. She had found out that he was a minister and she had come to his office. She had a daughter who was sick. She said, Dr. Craddock, Reverend Craddock, I, I, I need you to heal my daughter. I need you to come and heal her. She's sick and I've tried everything. Fred said, well, I, I, I don't have that gift. I, don't, I, can, I can pray for you. No, no, no. You're a, you're a minister. You're a follower of Jesus, right? And he said, well, yes, yes. He said, I need you to come heal my daughter. And he said, ma'am, I'm sorry. All I, all I can do is pray for her. And she said, well, what good are you anyway? What good are you anyway? I've been there before. Standing by the hospital bed, the sound of the ventilator, the beeping of the monitors, like the ticking hands on a clock. I've been there. His loved ones beg for a change in condition, a glimmer of hope that their son, sister, father, brother will come out of this. And in the weight of all that grief, all I could muster to say was, uh, let, let's pray. I mean, it's a comfort to know someone is praying for you. But when you're at the end of your rope, when there's no other option seemingly left, and you're looking for a miracle, it's hard. But Jesus said some, sometime somewhere else, Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these. And the voice from the cloud says, This is my son. Listen to him. Life down from the mountain is hard. It's real. It's full of complications, contradictions, adversities, overwhelming and heartbreaking situations. But the life of faith is a life lived down from the mountain. Yes, there are times when we need to meet up on the mountain, when we need to gather for worship, for prayer, for encouragement and guidance. Those times, like these times on Sunday mornings, are a vital part of the life of a Christ follower. But if all we do is hunker down where we are comfortable, where we are safe, where all seems to be right with the world, where everything is as it used to be, and the world out there is changing, but we can all keep it safe in here when we are at peace, well then, friends, I'm afraid we're not doing what the voice from the cloud tells us. To listen to Jesus. For Christ himself came down from the mountain. 
And Christ calls us to follow him down from the mountain. Out the doors of the sanctuary and out into that world. Not to condemn it. Not to point our fingers at it. Not to outline the ways that it's messed up and wrong. But to save it. To share the good news of a loving God in Christ Jesus. To come down from the mountain where there are people hungry and give them food. Where there are people who are thirsty to give them drink. People who are naked who need clothes. People who are afflicted who need comfort. People who are oppressed who need justice. To bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And friends, we can't do that if we just build tabernacles and stay up on the mountain. If Christ's transfiguration teaches us anything, I think it's this. That yes, here it is. Here's the glimpse. Christ is fully God. And in that confession, we must also confess that God has come down to us to show us the way of true love. To show us the ways of God's kingdom. Because Jesus said many times all over the gospel. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in another place, he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And the voice from the cloud, the voice of God says to us today, this is my son. Listen to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, as we come now, Lord, here in this place, where at times it seems we're up on the mountain, help us, Lord, to know that you call us down to the work of your kingdom. And help us, God, to listen, to listen to you and to believe, to do that which you call us to do. So move in our presence now, Holy Spirit. Respond as you would have us to respond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.